In the previous section, we began looking at the science fit method by focusing on the first two steps of the science fit method. If you remember, we talked about uh, making observations and then forming a hypothesis. So in this second section of chapter one, we're going to look at uh, the third and fourth steps of the science fit method, which would be actually doing the experiment and then finally forming the conclusion. So remember, the whole purpose uh, in doing the experiment is to test the hypothesis. Remember, one of the characteristics of a hypothesis is that it has to be be testable and falsifiable. We have to be able to, uh, to be right or uh, to be wrong. So in any experiment, uh, one thing, first term or factor that we want to consider uh, are what are called variables. Now, by definition, variables are simply factors of an experiment that may change. Uh, so it's any part of an experiment that could be changed or could change. Now, uh, there's mainly two types of variables to consider in an experiment. The first one's called an independent variable. Uh, the second is the dependent variable. And again, I have a lot of students who get these mixed up, so we want to be very very, very clear here. So the independent variables are those variables or those factors that are manipulated by the researcher. Uh, another way of putting it or that you might want to add in this little section of your notes is, um, is that independent variables, they're the thing that you're testing. You know, so say, for example, if you were testing a new drug um, and you gave, you know, uh, one group the drug you're testing and the other group you gave a sugar pill, uh, well the independent variable, the thing that you're testing is you're testing the drug. Uh, and so that would be your independent variable. So these are the things that are going to be manipulated or changed by the researcher and again typically they're the thing that you're testing. The dependent variables, uh, also known as the response variables, these are not changed by the researcher but they are the observable effects of what was changed. In other words, the dependent variable, they're the thing that you're measuring. Uh, now, the best way to, to truly understand these two variables is to look at an example. So let's look at this experiment. As a lab technician for Blavit Labs, your research division has stumbled across a new drug that you believe will cure male pot pattern baldness. You design an experiment with 500 men who have been diagnosed with male pattern baldness. They're divided into two groups. Group A men will receive the drug. Group B men will receive a placebo, which is a drug that has no effect on baldness. The men will receive the drug or a placebo once a day. All of the men will have the numbers of hair per square inch of scalp measured in a clinic once per week. So considering that experiment, take a moment and see if you can figure out what the independent variable and the dependent variable is. Now remember, the independent variable is the thing that the researcher changes, the thing that they're testing for. So what would be the independent variable of this experiment? Well, I hope you said it would be the drug. The drug is the thing you're testing for. The drug is the thing that has been changed or manipulated by the researcher. So then the second question here is, what would be the dependent variable? Well, remember, the dependent variable is the observable effects of the study, or it's the measurement. And what are we measuring here? It's the number of hairs per square inch of scalp would be the dependent variable. Now, a couple other things to consider about an experiment is that all experiments are going to have what we call controls and or control groups. Now, controls by definition, it's any part of an experiment that stays the same. If, for example, if I were doing an experiment on plants and I wanted to see if fertilizer actually helps plants grow, you know, I definitely would give some plants fertilizer and others not, but I would want to make sure that I was doing the same type of plant. I'd want to make sure that I was giving them the same amount of water, the same amount of sunlight. So controls are important because there are things about the experiment that you're going to keep the same. Now the control group is similar to that in that the control group is the group of people or the group of organisms that you're testing that stays the same. They do not receive the independent variable. Now controlled experiments are really, really important. Controlled experiments are typically those that are considered to be more valid. In a controlled experiment, a couple of key characteristics, first off, is to test the effect of a single independent variable. What that really means is that you're only changing one thing at a time. 
you know you wouldn't want to give some individuals one type of drug and some other individuals a different type of drug and some give different amounts of, of food some give extra water some give extra exercise and you have all these things you're changing the problem with that is if you have too many variables too many things you're changing it's hard to tell what actually caused your effect now a second thing of a controlled experiment is you want to limit alternate hypotheses you want your hypothesis that you're testing to be one that at the end of the experiment it's very easy to see if it was proven or disproven but not because of other alternate hypotheses and again differences in the results should be due to treatment of the independent variable not other things that you might possibly change so when I'm doing a controlled experiment there's really just two basic steps that I would do first off I want to make sure that I have a control group and an experimental group so you have a group that's going to stay the same and a group that's going to get the treatment and I want to make sure that I do random assignment to that because if I'm specifically putting individuals in each group um, then it's 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 not random anymore um, and it becomes something that potentially could be biased and then again identical participation for both groups except for the testing treatments you want to make sure that everything else is controlled uh, stays the same in the groups except for the thing that you're actually testing so again the same experiment we talked about before uh, remember you're testing a new drug divided the men into two groups group A received the drug group B received the placebo based on what we just talked about with controls is group A or B the experimental group and which one is the control group? Well, I hope you said the experimental group is group A because they're the ones that are receiving the drug. The control group would be group B because they're the ones that are not receiving the change. Now, the final step in the scientific method is to form a conclusion. Very simply, the conclusion is a statement that either accepts or rejects your hypothesis. So either it's going to say that your hypothesis was proven, or, or I'm sorry, was supported, or was not supported. Now remember we, we don't use the term proven here. Um, in order for your hypothesis to be proven this would have to be an experiment that had to be repeated time and time again get the same results and then over time uh, we could consider it something that is proven. Now one other thing that we do want to mention at the very end of this chapter um, is uh, minimizing bias. Now bias by definition is any influence on the results. It's very important in science that we that we maintain objectivity. You know, and if you're familiar with the terms objective and subjective, you know, if things are subjective, you're allowed to put your opinions in it. You know, like in an English class when you write an essay, in an essay you're allowed to put your own opinions in it. That's very subjective. In science, though, and especially in experience, we want to be very objective. Objective means very factual lack of opinions and the reason we want to be objective um, is because you can prove facts you cannot prove opinion so one of the things that we try to do in experimental design is we try to minimize bias in our experiments one of the ways we do that is blind studies uh, blind studies simply says we limit participant knowledge we don't allow uh, the participants to know which group they're in. So for example uh, with our experiment of the, the men with male pattern baldness we wouldn't tell uh, those in group A that they're getting that particular drug nor would we tell the men in group B that they're getting a placebo uh, because we don't want your mind to play tricks on you. It's called psychosomatic effects. We don't want your brain to influence symptoms. Uh, so blind studies just say you don't know which group you're in. Another strategy for minimizing bias is we do what are called double blind studies. And in a double blind study, not only does the participant not know which group they're in, but the researcher that's in charge of the experiment also doesn't know. So there's very little room for them to sway or to bias the results. And you can just kind of see here from, uh, from the, the visual uh, of ways uh, to minimize bias. So the very last experiment that we're going to look at in class, um, and if you want to, uh, I'll just leave it on the screen, uh, give you an opportunity to read this, um, and then once you have read this experiment, you can kind of pause if you need some extra time to read it, and then see if, based on the observation and the hypothesis, here's the experiment, see if you could answer these questions.